I played 12 games of Pokemon at the exact same time. But if this isn't crazy enough, I took it to the next level. Each of the 12 games have been completely randomized, so no two games are alike. Each Seed of Emerald has randomized starters, wild Pokemon, gym Pokemon, movesets, abilities, and items. This is Pokemon at its most chaotic, and to do it across 12 games simultaneously is a headfirst dive into insanity. Will the mayhem break the game completely, or worse, will it break me? I kick the games off, naming myself either Ryan or my accidental alter ego, Sisbo. In this challenge, I'm controlling 12 characters at the same time, kind of like my own multiverse, but a multiverse where all 12 of my moms don't care about my safety. I'm controlling these little dudes with one controller paired to all games, so when I click up or press A, it does it across all 12 games. It's time to pick my starting Pokemon, but I need to come clean about something. I'm not playing 12 games. I'm playing 13. There's a secret extra game running alongside the other 12, but I'm not looking at it. I want to see if the same inputs lead to the same results, or at least maybe getting a gym badge or two. Stick around to the end of the video to see what happens, and put your predictions for the 13th game in the comments below. Also, you should subscribe, because scientifically, it's good for you. The starter Pokemon is probably the most important decision in this challenge. Because it takes so long to level up other Pokemon, whoever I pick will be my main fighter throughout the game. I need to make sure that the starter is strong enough to carry me all the way through the Elite Four. And because the controls are paired to all 12 games, I can't pick and choose per game. The options in the Torchic spot are by far the weakest. We do have one Legendary, but I really want to avoid weaker one-stage Pokémon, like Shuckle or Chimeco. These Pokémon will never get stronger because they don't evolve. This even includes Eevee, since items are randomized, so Evolutionary Stones may not be available. Shedinja is also fairly bad as my Ace, because I will certainly run into Pokémon that it's weak to. The Pokémon in the Trico spot are much better, as most of them evolve. Plus, <laughs> you're gonna be gulp But I ultimately decide to go with the Pokémon in the Mudkip slot. We also have a Legendary here, and a bunch of fully evolved Pokémon. There's only a single one-stage Pokémon. So, I lock in my selection, and hopefully these Pokémon will carry me to success. Now that my starter is secured, I need to start working my way through the map. These games are already wildly chaotic, so to minimize the chaos, my goal is to keep the games synced up with each other. Primarily, that means ensuring my characters move together in the overworld. But Pokémon is inherently a random game, so my games can easily be thrown out of sync. Luckily, I've developed a few tricks I can use to make meaningful progress. The first and most important overworld trick is called cornering. Walls and corners on the map allow me to use directional inputs without moving my position, so I can stay in place while navigating straggler games to the same location. Everyone is now caught up, and we can keep going. This is my primary method of moving as I walk across Hoenn. Even crazier than this, though, is the insanity of Pokémon battles. There is so much happening at once that there's just no way to understand it all. So, my go-to strategy on the first attempt of a fight is just to keep clicking A. This will use some good moves and some moves that don't really do anything. As games begin to win, I have less things to focus on so I can make better choices. Some games win and others lose, so I have to try them again. Once all the games are complete, I can move on. Every trainer in this game has random Pokemon, so a Zigzagoon could become something much stronger. Here, I make it to Petalburg using another overworld strategy, Pokémon Centering. This is a variation of cornering, using the walls of the Pokémon Center to keep me in one location. The first few games will make it to the Pokémon Center of the next town, and they'll be trapped inside while I navigate the straggler games along. Once everyone is here, we can heal up and push forward. Using our overworld strategies, we navigate through the Petalburg Woods, and our team members are already starting to grow up. 
After about an hour and a half, we make it to Rustboro City, where we can take on the first gym leader, Roxanne. Her Pokemon will all be random, so let's see what lies ahead. Roxanne has three Pokemon in Emerald, so the chance you have a good matchup against all of them is low. On my first attempt, where I'm just mashing A to see what happens, I actually get two victories. One where Typhlosion can bully some weaker Pokemon, and one where Agron actually defeats a Suicune somehow. Truly, anything goes in this game. On the second attempt, I have less to pay attention to, so I can make some better choices. This leads to two more victories, and I continue to pick up wins as I go. Sometimes this is just based on pure luck, but the good thing is I only have to get lucky once. Eventually, I'm left with three games that are really struggling. First, I have a Steelix that gets decimated by Roxanne's Growlithe with Heat Wave. The second problem is my Wingle game, as it's already a weak Pokemon, and Roxanne's Persian knows Thunderbolt, Wingle's biggest weakness. Third is Tyranitar, who is countered by Roxanne's Sceptile. There are a few ways to deal with these bad matchups. My Tyranitar game wins by going for high ceiling plays, like by going for Rock Blast. In the other two games, I realize that if I want to win, I need to catch additional team members that can counter Roxanne's Pokemon. The wild Pokemon available are all low level though, so I'm unsure if they'll be strong enough to be helpful. To counter Growlithe, I catch a Star Army. Not only is the water type great against the fire type, but it's really fast. So fast that at level 8, it outspeeds a level 12 Growlithe, and one hit KOs with Hydro Cannon. Steelix can handle Roxanne's Pinsir since it knows Blaze Kick, for some reason, and Starmie can take out the Fan Pee as well. For my final Roxanne fight with Wingle, a ground Pokemon like Trap Inch should counter electric moves. But through this Trap Inch, I learn what actually makes a good team composition for this challenge. I'm calling this strategy the Secondary Effect Sidekick. These other wild Pokemon that I catch are weak, so their damaging moves generally don't do a lot. But what they can do well is inflict secondary effects. Here, I'm able to use Trap Inch to lower Persian's accuracy and speed. This allows Wingle to move before Persian, taking it out and avoiding the Thunderbolt completely. Lowering stats and status conditions don't change based on how strong the Pokemon is. And because of this realization, I now have the first badge in all 12 games. Next, I slowly navigate the squad to Rust Turf Tunnel to retrieve Pico, and back to Petalburg to pick up a very important item that I'll be using shortly. Now I can make the trip down to Duford Town, but before I take on the second gym, I decide to find Steven in the Granite Cave. Caves are tough in a challenge like this, because each space could start a wild Pokemon battle. Again, I want to avoid out-of-sync games at all costs, so I go ahead and use Repels. This prevents me from running into any wild Pokemon, making my navigation much easier. When the Repels run out, I wait for everyone to be done, so I can use another Repel in sync. We give the letter to Steven, and now we can take on the second gym leader. And after the trouble I had with Roxanne, I'm sure Brawly will be much easier. <laughs> Okay, most games actually have no problem breezing past Brawly. In fact, most get by in the first 20 minutes or so. But I don't move on until all 12 games win. And this time, I have three games really, really struggling. First is my starter, Banet, who has to take on a Persian that knows Crunch. Seriously, who would have thought Persian would be my major roadblock for this challenge? I catch a Raichu to potentially slow down Persian with Paralysis. And I find a Slaking, which I will definitely catch. Since abilities are randomized, Slaking doesn't have Truant, so it's basically a legendary Pokemon. Banet can take out Magikarp, and I bring in Slaking to fish for a defense drop with Crush Claw, but it just gets a crit, so I can take on the final Pokemon, another Magikarp. I spent almost an hour trying to beat a team where 66% was Magikarp. In another game, Agron gets completely walled by Sandslash, as Earthquake does so much damage. So I catch a level 12 War Turtle as my secondary effect sidekick. I'm going for a speed drop with Bubble Beam, but end up with a miss into Hydro Cannon kill. Agron can take out Houndoom with rock moves, and the team can wrap up the fight. 
but we're starting to develop a problem child, as Wingle is once again having the hardest time. Brawly's Sableye is no problem, but his ace is Lugia, and poor Wingle doesn't have the stats or typing to compete with that. Since I already have extra Pokemon from the Roxanne fight, I sacrifice them to Lugia's Psycho Boost, which lowers its special attack. Now I'm taking weaker moves from Lugia, and fishing for a burn with Wingle's extremely unsettling ability, Flame Body. Keeping myself healthy with Super Potions, I can finally take out Lugia, and also defeat the Tauros in the back. As a reward for finally beating the gym, Wingle finally evolves into a helpful Pokemon. However, we're now five hours into the challenge, and I only have two badges. Next, I navigate the crew to Slateport City, where we defeat the Team Aqua Grunts in the museum. The next 30 minutes or so are pure chaos, as I need to get through Route 110. Not only are there a bunch of wild Pokemon and trainers, I also have a rival battle smack in the middle of it. My Pokemon are mostly in the mid to late 20s, so it's not like this fight is extremely hard, it's just tough to focus on. If I die, I get sent all the way back to Slateport, and at one point I had a very funny half and half split on who got sent back. Just after the 6 hour mark, and every game is in Mauville, which means we can now take on the third gym leader, Watson. The first two gyms gave me plenty of trouble, so this third one has to be easier, right? Watson is the first gym leader with four Pokemon, but overall his team composition just isn't that strong. In fact, after about a half an hour, eight games have already beat him, and that includes my Pelipper game. They've really grown up so much. There are two games that end up struggling a bit. The first is my game with a Steelix, because Watson has a team stacked against him. We have a Dugtrio that knows Earthquake, and an Arcanine that knows Overheat, so no wonder he's struggling. After enough attempts, Steelix is at level 31, and with its high defense, it can tank Earthquakes, and retaliate with Meteor Mash that takes out Dugtrio. Arcanine and its special moves are different though, but since I already dealt with a similar problem in a previous gym, I do have Starmie. Starmie has primarily been effective at dealing damage, but here I actually go for the move that deals less damage, because if Zap Cannon hits, it always paralyzes your foe. Jimba can take out the paralyzed Arcanine, and take out the rest of Watson's team. My other game struggling against Watson is one that hasn't had much trouble so far. That would be my game with Eren. At the beginning of a game, having a first stage Pokemon is normal, but at this point, to have an unevolved Pokemon puts me at a disadvantage, especially when Watson has a Rayquaza. Sometimes, figuring out how to beat these tough fights feels like a puzzle, and here I found a really unique solution. In Emerald, there are many move tutors hanging out in different cities. There's one right outside the Mauville gym, and he normally teaches rollout, but in this randomizer, all the moves are, well, randomized. So in this game, the move tutor teaches Encore. This is important because Rayquaza knows the move Dragon Dance, so I can Encore it into using this move, forcing it to continue raising its stats instead of attacking me. I can slowly chip away its health and take it out before Encore ends. All 12 games now have the third badge. But before my games can get any further, I need to start using HMs. Many of my starting Pokemon can learn moves like Surf, Strength, and Rock Smash, but these are critical move slots that can be better utilized with other moves. So I need to start catching additional team members, whose main role is to use HMs. If I were to try to catch these new team members all at the same time, I would be catching a lot of unnecessary Pokemon, and wasting a lot of money on Pokeballs to do so. For more intricate procedures like this, I actually need to do the opposite of what I've been doing the entire run. I need to desync, and here's how I do it. This is a very nuanced activity, so pay close attention. First, I get everyone lined up in the Pokemon Center. Then I frantically press the directional inputs. This will often leave the characters in different spots, especially if there's an NPC that moves randomly. Then I can navigate the game I need out the door, and go do whatever I need to do. In this case, 
Catch a Pokemon that knows Rock Smash. It takes about a half an hour to go game by game, but now I have a Rock Smasher on every team. And sometimes I find special surprises, like my new team member who was holding a Focus Band. I will absolutely take that, thank you. Now I just have a lot of overworld traversing to do. Going to Verdanturf to get strength, moving through the Fiery Path and Route 113 to get to Fall Arbor, confronting Team Aqua in Meteor Falls, and going all the way back to get to Mount Chimney. Thanks to Repels, I'm able to get to Maxi in under two hours. Maxi is easy, and once he's defeated, we can all take on Flannery, who is also easy. Six of my games beat Flannery on the very first try. In fact, the only game with even a bit of trouble is my Tyranitar game, and that's because Flannery has, you guessed it, a fighting Pokemon. In a randomizer, anything with a times four weakness is often going to have trouble. In this game, my Rock Smasher is a Swalot that knows Toxic, so I can use it to slowly hurt Hariyama and get the fourth badge in each game in under half an hour. Immediately after this, we can take on the fifth gym leader, Norman. And there are some games that have been absolutely killing it, as evidenced by the disparity in level. Mewtwo has been so strong that it barely needs to redo fights. It's a special attacker that also has huge power, so it's basically unstoppable. Glalie has also been doing rather well, especially due to it knowing a high ceiling move like Sheer Cold. It only has to hit once. Typhlosion has also been doing really well, although its low level is mostly due to the fact that the HM user I caught was holding an experience share, which ends up just taking away from Typhlosion. For quote-unquote weaker Pokemon, both Nidorino and Sneasel have been solid, although both have to deal with Groudons on Norman's team, and both struggle a little bit. But this gym again takes about a half an hour, and although we had a bit of a slow start, the teams are really hitting their stride. After this gym, I can use Surf outside of battle, so I need to make sure I have a Surfer on each team. Once I do, we can begin the trek up to Fortree. Even controlling 12 games, the journey isn't bad. We have to stop at the Weather Institute to take on Team Aqua, but the real hurdle is to take on my rival. She's not that difficult, but losing to her in four games sends me all the way back to Mauville. So it takes a bit of work to get everyone to Fortree, getting the Devon Scope from Steven, and ready to take on Winona in the sixth gym. Except the Winona fight is the easiest one I've encountered so far, with every team beating her in the first two attempts. I only spotted one legendary Pokemon on any of her teams, but with everyone's level into the 40s now, my Pokemon are just that strong. The gym fights may have gotten easy, but next I need to take on... There's a lot to tackle in this next portion of the game. First, I need to navigate down to Mount Pyre. The routes on the way are long and winding, and there's even a few sections that are like a maze. That's not even counting the wild Pokemon and the numerous trainer battles. One tiny extra step in one game may lead to a tough double battle. Then you have to climb Mount Pyre itself. And once that's done, you need to travel over to Lava Ridge, as the Magma Hideout is waiting for you. The fastest way to do that is to fly there, which means I need to catch a flying Pokemon in each game. This takes some time, but I am able to find one. Except for my Nidorino game, where I check every location near Mount Pyre, but can't find a single Pokemon that learns fly. Finally, I am able to catch a Murkrow, but the fun is just getting started. The Magma Hideout is basically a big cave, so I need to repel through it. But there's tons of battles with grunts, so a few of my games get sent back to Loveridge before I'm even close to finishing. And speaking of the finish, you need to fight Maxi at the end. Only my Tyranitar game is able to make it all the way through without dying. And that's probably because in this game, I found a random leftovers. So Tyranitar is able to stay healthy. Strength is also needed to get through the Magma Hideout. And it's even tough to navigate through the menu to teach strength, because those inputs are also running to the other games. 
Simply, it's just so much to keep track of. From the time I beat Winona, to the time I reached Lily Cove, a whole four hours have passed. The Aqua Hideout is much easier though, and now I can surf the team over to Moss Deep, where I can finally take on the seventh gym leaders, Tate and Liza. Yes indeed, one of the hardest fights during a regular playthrough is also one of the hardest fights here. The reason should be fairly obvious. This is the only gym leader fight in a double battle format. You thought seeing 24 Pokemon on screen was a lot? Try 48, baby! Aside from the million things going on at the same time, I have another major issue. Most games really only have one good Pokemon, so I have a scrub out there doing pretty much nothing. This process does give me a new strategy though. In Gen 3, when one of your Pokemon dies in a double battle, you're forced to send another out, even if it's the middle of a turn. This allows me to focus on the games that are actively battling, and by clicking A, I just stay selected on the Pokemon that's already out. Once all the games have lost a team member, I can continue. It's not a perfect strategy, but it does allow me to hyper-focus on some fights. Despite the craziness, I actually have five games that win on the first try. Other games are able to win over the next few attempts, but I have four games that are struggling more than the others. Tyranitar has to go up against a Mewtwo and a Feraligator that knows Cross Chop, but eventually I realized that Relicanth doesn't know a strong water move, so by immediately using Toxic on it, and then focusing my efforts on the other party slot, I can let the Toxic do the work for me. Glalie also has some trouble, since Tate and Liza have a Rapidash. I win here by switching around my team to avoid taking super effective fire moves. I get a bit lucky and win the fight. Agron has to contend with a Suicune who does so much damage to it, but I use a familiar strategy here, going for high ceiling plays, and moves that one hit KO have the highest ceiling, Heaven. The game that has it the worst is with Steelix. Tate and Liza's Magmar using Eruption is a recipe for disaster, so I go out and catch a whole new Pokemon just for this fight but it can be a good damage dealer and a good secondary effect sidekick. With Magmar slowed down, we can take it out, and after about two hours of fighting, I have the seventh badge in all 12 games. Next, I need to wrap up the plot of these games, and thanks to my solid planning ahead, all of my surfers are also divers, so we can head to the seafloor cavern to confront Archie, triggering the crazy weather. Now I head over to the Sky Pillar and stop Kyogre and Groudon's sibling rivalry thanks to Rayquaza. Speaking of Rayquaza, we have a game-defining event coming up. But before I get to that, it's time to take on the eighth and final gym leader, Juan. The hardest part about this gym might be trying to do the puzzle in 12 games at once, because Juan is super easy, and I can beat him in every game in about a half an hour. That brings us to a grand total of 96 badges. And hey, maybe we can reach 100 badges if the 13th game just gets 4 badges. I only have one more thing to do before Victory Road and the Elite Four, but aside from catching the starter, this is the most important event in the run. As I alluded to earlier, this special event is catching Rayquaza. Except, of course, it's not Rayquaza. It's a randomized Pokemon. This encounter is at level 70, so it will be the most important team member for the Elite Four run. Whether these Pokemon are good or bad will define the rest of the challenge. I nervously climb up the Sky Pillar, praying to Arceus above that we get good Pokemon. The Pokemon that I get are a Legendary, a Pseudo-Legendary, three mediocre final evolutions, a few first stage evolutions that get much better after evolving, one Pokemon stuck in its middle evolution, and finally, three of the absolute worst single stage evolutions. These Pokemon are not great. 
but capturing them is still the best move. Remember how items are randomized? Well, that includes the Master Ball normally found in the Aqua Hideout, which means I'm going to have to catch this Pokemon with Ultra Balls. The best strategy for me is to throw balls instead of attacking, because if I accidentally kill this Pokemon, I can't catch it again. Some games take quite a few Ultra Balls, but I am able to successfully catch this Pokemon in each of the 12 games. The teams are now ready to take on Victory Road, so we hit the waterfall, spray on our Repel, and work our way through the cave. A few games die and have to go back, but after 25 hours of work, we've made it to the final hurdle of this challenge. The Pokemon League is a gauntlet of fights with the Elite Four and Champion, all with random Pokemon. My teams certainly have the level advantage, but with 12 games happening simultaneously, it's impossible to make the best move in every game. On my first attempt, only four games make it past Sydney, and two make it past Phoebe. With only two things to focus on, both make it past Glacia, but each falls against Drake. How on earth am I going to get these games through this insanity? Well, here's my loose attempt at a plan. Step 1. Identify the superstars. Over the course of this playthrough, I've noticed that there are two teams that have absolutely breezed through the game. The first is my Mewtwo game. Although the level 70 Pokemon is a Delibird, huge power Mewtwo doesn't need any help. The second game is the Tyranitar game. Although he has a major weakness to fighting attacks, the Leftovers item has been extremely helpful. Even more helpful is the team's level 70 Slay King. The reason I'm highlighting both these teams now is because I think both can beat the Pokemon League right now without any other preparation. So, I tried the Elite Four again in every game, but I'm really only focusing on Mewtwo and Tyranitar. Mewtwo is owning anything that the trainers throw at him, and by keeping Switch Mode on, I can pivot between Tyranitar and Slaking whenever I need to. Both games work their way through Phoebe, through Glacia, and through Drake before we finally reach the champion, Wallace. Mewtwo can choose between Psychic, Bone Rush, or Rock Throw to get super effective matchups, and Slaking and its immense attack completely overwhelm Wallace's Pokemon. The first two games are victorious, but for the other 10, we have some work to do. Step two is catching a full team. Each game has a starter leveled into the 50s or 60s, as well as a level 70 Pokemon, and a bunch of low-level HM losers, I mean users. We need to beef these teams up. Victory Road has randomized Pokemon right around level 40, so if I choose strong Pokemon to catch, they should be able to hold their own. Step 3 is buying helpful items, like Hyper Potions, Revives, and Full Heals. That way, if I have a run, make it to Drake or Wallace, I don't have to worry about keeping myself healthy. Steps 2 and 3 go really well together, because if my team members can take multiple hits, I have more turns to revive and heal up my heavy hitters. Step 4 is teaching moves through TMs, which are randomized in this game. I need to make sure my Pokemon have a moveset that takes advantage of their strengths, can hit a wide array of Pokemon, and has enough PP to make it through all 5 fights. Step 5 is using rare candies to level up any Pokemon that need to evolve, because why have a level 70 Torchic when you could have a level 72 Blaziken. Completing these steps in each game takes a long time. While I was doing this, my Pelipper and Kingler game accidentally walked into the Elite Four. So I decided to just play it out. Wingle was such a weak Pokemon at the beginning of this run, causing so many losses across the first two gyms. But Pelipper has become something truly incredible, an absolute stud. Also, I caught a Shedinja that makes most Pokemon irrelevant, but hey, the run goes all the way, and we have three games now complete. For the other nine games, we've done so much setup. So it's time for step six, execute. I could desync and try to beat these games one at a time, but 
That's stupid and lame, so we're going in all at the same time. My strategy is to identify the strongest remaining game, so I can focus on that one. First, that's the game with Blaziken and Banet, and I switch between the two to get the best matchup. By playing the other games at the same time, not only do they gain extra experience, but I can see which games make it the farthest. And since those games look strong, they can be my focus for the next run. My Dodrio and Duskull game made it to Glacia, so I focus on them for the next run. And they are also successful. My team with Glalie and a Noctowl that knows Spore are next to defeat Wallace, followed by a team of Nidorino and Mew, then Typhlosion and Nidorino, and after that, a team with Breloom and Agron. Those teams were built with strong Pokemon, but I've identified three games where that's not the case. The game with Sneasel as a starter was given a level 70 ditto, and thanks to random movesets, it can't even transform. As a single stage Pokemon, Sneasel isn't terribly strong, and with a weak teammate, this game understandably has a tough time. For this run, I rely a lot on my other teammates, and heal as much as possible. Ditto basically does nothing on this run, and Sneasel absolutely guts it out. This team gets a well-earned victory. The most surprising team on the struggle bus is one with Agron and Pilloswine. They're both final evolutions, so why are they struggling so much? Well, they're both extremely slow, so they take damage before attacking, which adds up over time. Agron has had this exact issue throughout the game, meaning I've lost many battles with him. That means this game has less money than the others, and I can't afford a ton of Hyper Potions and Revives, so if I have a run get pretty far, I can't always stay healthy enough. I finally get on a good run, but I don't have any healing items left. I absolutely scratch and claw my way to a victory, mostly thanks to Wallace having pretty weak Pokemon. But the final game? Oh man, this final game. Not only was poor Steelix given a terrible teammate in Dunsparce, but instead of Serene Grace, this Dunsparce has Truant. This awful Pokemon can only attack every other turn, making it double awful. As a silver lining, this Dunsparce does know a good stab move in Thrash, so it can actually get a few kills. And by playing in Switch Mode, I can move him out without having to take a Loaf turn. Obviously, this takes a lot of focus and planning, so it's good that this is the last game. It takes a few attempts, but this ragtag squad finally has a good run going. That's mostly thanks to Jimba, who now is at level 71, and wrecking his opponents. Wallace's last Pokemon falls, securing us the final champion victory. We can call it. 12 completely randomized games of Pokemon is finally done, and all it took was 33 hours, 50 minutes, and 48 seconds. But wait, we still need to see where the 13th game is. All right, here we go. Well, this looks like Old Dale Town, so I don't think we got too far. Let's double check and yep, no badges. Let's at least see what Pokemon we got. We have a level two Bellsprout. That's so awful. Wait, how is that even possible? Your starter is at level five, so what happened here? Did I release it or? Oh my god, I actually put it in the box. Somehow I navigated here and did this. And this is only possible because somehow I caught another Pokemon. If anyone predicted this in the comments, great work. If you enjoyed this video, I highly recommend you check out the video on screen now. Liking the video and subscribing are also very much appreciated. Take care and thank you so much for watching.